Live streaming is on. Okay, fantastic. So let me see if I can see it in my channel. We are already streaming live. Okay, there we go. Would you like to, um, well, you don't need to be introduced, but I would like you to tell people what you mentioned before about Buenos Aires and Argentina. Uh, hola, todo el mundo en Argentina. Um, my Spanish is poor, so I will not do too much of it and embarrass myself, but I uh, want to tell you that I have been to Argentina. I have been to Buenos Aires one time for a very short time, and I had a good time. And what I remember most is the very, very wide street that had more than 20 lanes for traffic in it. And then there was a big monument in the middle. And that was right where my hotel was. So I was, I had never seen a street that big and congratulations for having that. Okay. So I'm happy to be here with you and to answer all your questions. And uh, we're very lucky to have our host, uh, Carolina, to translate from Spanish into English so we can understand each other better. Thank okay. you. That'll be great. Okay, Mark, um, you, you became very popular among us when you wrote your natives and digitals like 20 years ago. And I would like you to tell us um, how we can use that to better understand the students we have in the classroom. Thank you. Uh, that was a very much of a surprise to me. I wrote the article now 20 years ago, Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants, and I got an email from New Zealand. And it said, we are the association, the Children's Association of New Zealand. We read your article in the newsletter of the Children's Association of Tasmania, which is part of Australia. Can we republish it? And I didn't, I said, oh, yeah, of course. But I didn't know that it got that far. And I learned, that's how I learned the power of the Internet. And when... When we do a, a, something like this, an interview like this that we're doing, when this goes live on the Internet, everybody will a be able to see it forever. And that's really something that's totally new in the world, and that's why I am so happy to do this. I run something called the Global Future Education Foundation that I started, and we now have a brand new project called Two Billion Kids Project, where we hope to be able to talk to and influence and work with every single kid in the world. And that we can do because we have the tools now. And what is a digital native like as a learner? Well, here's what I think now about digital natives and, and digital immigrants. I think what's happened is that we've had a big change of culture and that attitudes towards many things have begun to change. And so we have seen, for example, uh, certainly in my lifetime, that in America, certain racial attitudes have changed. Not completely, we're seeing that now on the television, but but. Attitudes have changed. Attitudes towards gay people have changed in many places. And attitudes toward technology, towards love, towards religion, towards God, towards many, many things are going to be different in the future. And I'm even reading, writing an article right now that says, do our kids need to be like us? Will they be like us? Because I think that in many ways they will be uh, different, even though in other ways they'll still be the same. So I see a new culture coming out. And even if people do the same actions, they don't have the same beliefs about those actions. And that's, that's so language is a wonderful example. And we'll get into this perhaps more. Kids can learn a language. Adults can learn a language. But their views about learning the language are going to be very different. The kid is going to know 
well, maybe I'll learn a few things now, but I know this is going to be all technology in a few years. So I don't, you know, have to do too much. The adults will think, oh, no, no, the technology, that might be even a bad way to communicate. So same actions, different beliefs. And what I think is to answer, go back to your question, I think the adults of today are what I call the last pre-internet generation the world will ever see. And then when today's adults die out in 50 years or 70 years, there will be no more people left from the pre-internet times. The kids are the first internet generation that the world has ever known. They're the first generation that grew up from zero with an internet. So what, is, what does that mean for learning? That's, that's your question and for teachers. I think that it means that we have to understand or that young people understand that we are on the road to becoming symbiotic with machines. And we will be in the future what I call symbiotic human-machine hybrids. And as, as teachers, we want to take advantage of that. But it's hard because we didn't grow up with it. So it's very hard for us. We think it's, oh, it's either in a good sense, we might say, oh, they have some new tools. In a bad sense, we say, well, that's not even human to use a calculator or to use the translator, you know. But it is equally human to use a translating machine as it is to use a dictionary. They're both human things. We just now can do it much more easily and quickly. So the as this moves along, I think that we need to think of our kids as machine and human hybrids. And if you think of them as that, then you have no question. Well, for this, you would use your human brain to think of what to say, what's polite, what's all this kind of stuff. Maybe that's a human brain thing. But to think about how to say it, the machine is actually better because it knows. And the same with math. We need the machines do the calculation, but the human has to think about what calculation to do. And with everything else. So I hope that is, is, is useful. And I had one more thought that this conversation inspired. If you wonder what a symbiotic relationship is, humans have had for several hundred years now a symbiotic relationship with books. It's, it goes two ways. We give a lot of effort to the books, we take care of them, we preserve them, we put them in libraries, we sort them, we catalog them, and the books feed us with the ideas and the things in the books. So in a sense, there's a symbiotic relationship going on there, and that's why those things, if you look at the adult generation, books are so important. They're part of us as humans. They're part of our body. Well, the kids now have that same idea about the technology. And some of us have moved to the technology faster. So I, I only read books now on my phone. I only watch videos and TV on my phone uh, because I like that. But, but the, the idea is that I can. That's the idea. So when I walk down the street, I carry with me in my pocket my entire library. Every book that I have read in the past 10 years is on my phone. And if I want to look something up, and if I remember, oh, yeah, that person said something very interesting about that. Now I'm very interested in, in uh, Noah Yuval Harari. So I have all his books. I have all my notes on all his books right in my pocket. That's hugely different. That's, that's enormously different than what happened before. So um, there you go. Those are some ways. If we think about our kids that way, 
that they're kids who have human parts and they're kids who have machine parts. And how do we use those two together wisely? I think we'll go much further, much faster. You mentioned translators. And for us, most of the people watching here are teachers of English. So how can we integrate translation, machine translation in the classroom? Well, we are just learning how to do that. This is, this is a period of invention. This is a period where if you do it the old way, you're wrong. But if you do something new, you may not be right yet. So you have to try and you have to experiment. But one of the things, let's, let's just talk about the videos. We'll talk maybe later. But one of the things that surprised you, I learned that very early that the technology allows you, when you watch a video, say on YouTube, to make that video go up to twice as fast or twice as slow and not change the voice. It's not like the old tape recorders where it's starting to sound like this. <laughs> it doesn't do that at all. It just makes it faster. And that is enormously helpful in language learning because you can slow everything down. And once you can slow it down, something that you couldn't understand maybe the first time, you say, oh, okay, now I hear what they're saying. It's first it sounded like, and now I hear words because it's going more slowly. So that's a huge tool that you can use. Uh, the other tool, of course, the great tool is connecting with real people. And that's something we couldn't do before. But you can say to a kid, you know, um, you've got, uh, you're on, you may be on the time zone of the U.S. in some places. I don't know where you are, but I, I bet Argentina and the U.S. have at least one time zone in common. Is that true? Yes, I think so. Maybe New York or wherever. Maybe New York. I think so New York say, is not the time zone. Okay. Then why doesn't every kid have a buddy in New York? And you say, okay, for the next 10 minutes, FaceTime your buddy in New York and talk English and talk Spanish or whatever you have to do. That, and you just set that up. You could set it up with another teacher or class. Um, and because the time zone is the same, you'll both be in school. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we can now do that we couldn't do at all in the past. And if we think about those things, if, if really what we think about is what can we do because our kids have new powers and they can, if they want to say something complicated in the language, that's when the machine is really helpful because the problem with language learning is that, at least for me, and I learned a lot of languages, when I'm in a new language, I can't say the things that I want to say. Because I talk, being the age that I am, about things that, that are more on the sophisticated level language-wise. But I don't know how to say that, say, in Spanish or in Japanese or in, in Portuguese or whatever language I'm doing it. A machine is hugely helpful to doing that. And so if I had to offer a technique, here's my technique. My, I've been trying to get teachers to do this forever. I would say to your kids, go record a conversation with your friends. Maybe do it for 10 minutes. Maybe do it for a whole day. I don't care. Write down what you say. This is you talking. This is how you talk to people, your friends. Now, learn to say that exact conversation in the other language. Ah, now you can say not, I have a pencil, but what you want to say. So if what you want to say is, I love this video game, or I've beaten the you know, heck out of you, you should know how to say that in the other language, right? Because that's how you talk. And to me, that's what's always been missing. Even when we make up dialogues, they're somebody else's dialogues. They're not your dialogues. Even if you had kids write their own dialogues, write a dialogue that you would have with your sister or with your friend or with your best friend. 
now translate we will translate that use the machine i don't even have to do it for you anymore me the teacher you can use the machine to translate that into the other language we can check it and maybe it's not perfect uh, but it will be pretty good and then if you learn that you'll say what you say in two languages and that's really good you something you tweeted a long time ago is that the purpose of technology is not to do what we used to do with technology but to do new things I and mean, this is this is great this is what we should be trying to do in in our classes i agree i still think that and that's the problem that's happened with with the covid virus is that the first reaction that that many educators had i won't say all of them because some of them didn't but was to take what we have what we do in the classroom and put it online so my kid has a lot of this here in california you know he would have done a presentation in class okay he does the same presentation but now he submits it in video he would have written a paper in class or taken a test in class he takes the exact same test on his computer and that changes nothing all that does is it makes life easier it does two things for the kids one it makes life easier for them but two it takes their friends away which is the best part of school for many of them so it's not such a great solution on the other hand suppose they were using what we just talked about and they were using the technology to make new friends suppose even though they're at home they're making friends in new york or miami or, or somewhere else or in any country uh, using the technology and learning the language and doing all of these things and you know and that could go to history it could go to what's happening it could go to current events it could go to anything you want so i it would be wonderful if the kids in an argentine class you know class in our were had little had kids in new york and they could say what's happening in your country i hear there are riots going on well first they'd learn the word riot you know but, <laughs> but but what is going on and then the kids could try to explain from their perspective and so not only would we get language but we'd get culture and we'd get understanding and we'd get connections and that kind of thing is what i would like to see more of this is fantastic. In one of your conferences, you, you said that technology is foundational in a way reading was in the past. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. I thought about that, and you, you asked me that question in advance, and I'm glad. And what I think I mean is that the relationship with technology is fundamental in the way the relationship with books has been in the past both of them as we discussed symbiotic so the reason you learn to read is because you put something into the book which is your effort and your own knowledge and you get something out of the book which is what's the ideas in the book and then it's a mix of those two things that actually matters right and now it's not just books but it's technology, it's people through videos, through audio, through so many things, and all the things we just talked about, you have to know how to use that well. You have to think of that as a part of you. Just like when you learn to read, really learn to read, you thought of books as a part of you, right? That's the way literate people see books, right? If you're not literate, they're paperweights. But that's so that's really i think the the what i would like to see that that the the relationship sorry i just knocked my power cord out of my computer uh what i would like to see is that the relationship between people and technology becomes as powerful and as fundamental as the relationship that has been around for only a few hundred years between people and books. Great. In the conference, you mentioned three tools that you believe are useful for teaching. You said Twitter, videos, and simulation. 
I'm so interested in that. Well, let's start with Twitter. Twitter is very interesting because it has 240 characters. It used to be 100, 280, I guess now. It used to be 140. But what Twitter it allows you, what that allows you to do is be very focused and precise. You have to say whatever it is you want to say in a few words. And we have lots of abbreviations and ats and all those things. But really, that's a very useful skill in some for some things. And you and I had this discussion earlier. You might want to say to your class, this is the single thing that I want you to remember about our class for the rest of your life. So a biology teacher, when I asked that question, I said, give me the tweet for your class. He said, all living things change. I thought that was beautiful. Or another one is literature is the way we understand human relations. That's why we read literature, not because it's famous, not because it's beautiful. Literature is the way we understand relations between people because that's what books are about. Or well, fiction books certainly are about many nonfiction. So if you're going to try to resume something and make it very short and memorable, Twitter is fabulous. What Twitter doesn't do well is nuance is to provide much detail and maybe this and maybe that. That's not Twitter's job. It's very hard. And that's, that's why it's very hard when, say, Donald Trump uses Twitter so much. Because he can only give one thought at a time and with no ideas about what he may mean or may not mean. And so everybody takes their own ideas about what he does mean and they either like him or get angry at him. And, and so it's not a good forum for, for expressing nuanced, complex ideas. But if for, for simple ideas, like, you know, don't, do, don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today, the kinds of uh, things that have always been around, we call them aphorisms, or I don't know what you call them in Spanish, you know, slogan, and what's the word in Spanish for? Aforismo, it's the same. Aforismo. So for those kinds of things, Twitter's fabulous. Twitter is fabulous. And even for short poetry like haiku, you can do that in a Twitter, in a tweet. But not for everything. So figure out what. Okay, that's Twitter. Next is video. Video is so important. It's so it's so much closer to how humans uh, have have communicated back and forth in our lives, right? We are sitting here having this conversation, and although it's not 100% two-way with everybody, between Carolina and me, it is two-way, and it's, it's almost as good as if we were in the same place. Not quite as good, but almost as good. And if there's a lot of noise or other things in the background, it could be better, right? But we can get to know each other this way in a way that's much harder if you just wrote letters or said, even sent emails uh, because seeing a person is, is part of being, uh, having human contact. That said, it's become a tool that now is very easy. It used to be a tool that was very hard to use. Now it's just we didn't even have to sign up for anything to do this. We just both clicked on the same URL and puff, we're connected. And everybody else who out there, thank you for being here, is listening to us. And so it's easy. It's Then we have to learn some new things. Like I had to think about what my background is. We're starting to do that. I'm going to set up a studio now so I can change things. We've, we're learning that you need multiple cameras so you can have a close-up of your face when you want to. And maybe a long shot. You might want to show some... Um, some screenshots or some ideas. How do you do that? So this is, I'm just learning this. This is new for me. And I now have a coach and all sorts of things to help me learn this. Uh, and I think we all need to do this. So if I were, again, if I were a teacher, 
I would say video all the time, every day, live, uh, recorded, slowed down, sped up. That The speed is the most critical thing. That you can change the speed of a video once it's recorded is, is so enormous because it means that if you want to take in information, if you're you know, say, getting professional development or there's some TED talk you want to watch or something, you can watch it in half the time. You just put it on double speed or sometimes 1.5 speed, and all the little things that, that we do in person go away. You don't need those things when you're listening to a video. And so that's really good, but the opposite is also good, for especially for language learning. To take a movie or a video and put it on half speed or whatever, you know, slow it down, you suddenly can understand it all because they're talking like this. So as language teachers, please investigate. And Carolina now knows where that little thing is in the corner so she can help you find it. And uh, please use that, and, and I'd love your feedback on how good it is. I, I have always thought it was the most important part of video. What was the third? The third one was simulation. Simulation. Simulation, simulation can be great for certain things. Right? Simulation is not good for teaching you information, but it's wonderful for teaching you behaviors and skills because you can fail and start again and fail and start again. And it's, it's the best thing if you can do it for that. So, you know, if you can uh, simulate giving a speech or simulate feedback or simulate all these things or simulate an audience reaction where you see it and you say something and you get the boo reaction or whatever, that's hugely useful. My son flies big airplanes, 737, 787, you know, A380, around the world in his simulation. All the airports are there. All the controls are there. All the places. So he knows how to do it. In, in language teaching... Yeah. In language teaching, we do a lot of something that is called acting out or role play that is a kind of simulation of the language. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're getting better at having the machines play the other role. Mm -hmm. So so right now we do we that's a totally a simulation with two people or more people. But now you for even more practice, because then you need two people and they both have to be in the mood and be ready or forced or whatever. But before you do that, if you both did this against the computer and you did this against the computer, and then you got together, think of how much better you'd be. So it gives you that practice. That's really what it does, that you need, that it's sometimes hard for people to give you because we're people. And if you're a teacher, you have, you know, 20, 30, 40 students. And so you can't do it one-to-one, -one, but the machine can give you a lot of that. Not all of it, but a lot of it. You said in, a, in probably a video or something that the goal of education is not to improve individual, but to improve the world. Well, here's, what, here's the more slightly more nuanced version, right? That's a tweet. Okay. That's a good tweet. Um, and I think that I still agree with that. But what I would say is that what I would like to get my goal for education or for working with kids is for the kids to become good, effective, world-improving people. So becoming is a big part of education. But the second part is, a, is, is accomplishment, is that you, because you are educated, you can get things done. So I don't see education as really fundamentally about learning. Many do. But I think learning is a means to accomplishment. The goal is accomplishment. The goal is becoming a good, effective, world-improving person. Those are the goals. The learning 
is one of the means. And so the interesting, what, what that means is that learning is only useful if it helps you accomplish those goals. If you know that you're going to America next month, suddenly learning English is very important to you. If you think you will never go to an English speaking country, who cares, right? So, so the learning is very specific to what you want to do and what you want to do. And I, my big categories of what you, I think people should want to do are becoming good, effective world improving people and accomplishing things in the world. And accomplishment is different from achievement. Achievement, and this is, I don't know if you can make the distinction in other languages besides English, but in English you can. Achievement is when you reach a personal goal by yourself. So becoming number one in your class is an achievement, or getting a degree is an achievement, or climbing to the top of the highest mountain is an achievement. But the only person that benefits is you. Whereas an accomplishment, in the way I use it, benefits at least one other and hopefully many other people besides you. So if you, if you, uh, you know, made your class all better in, and, and much better English speakers, that's not an achievement. That's an accomplishment. You've really done something, right? And you've benefited a lot of other people. If you learn to play the violin perfectly and you stay in your room, okay, it's an achievement. But if you give concerts and give lots of people pleasure, it's an accomplishment. So I try to make that distinction. And I think school should be much more about accomplishment than achievement. I would like to thank uh, Magdalena and Florencia because they are translating live in the chat. And I would like to ask people, because I can't think of, um, this distinction in Spanish between accomplishment and achievement, because I'm I'm listening to you so interested that maybe it's not coming to my mind. So if they if they find a possible translation for both terms, I would like them to say it in the chat. Well, good. I hope you do. And one thing you can do in one of my books, my latest book, which is called um, uh, Educación por Mejorar el Mundo. Okay. The um, the translation of Education to Better the World. There is a chapter called achievement versus accomplishment. So somehow they did translate that because the book exists in, in Spanish. So we can look that up in, in there. And if we had our phone, we could get the book and in Spanish on our phone and look it up right here. That's why that's the great advantage of technology. You can, I have my whole library in my pocket. And if I don't have it in my pocket, I can, download it from Amazon very quickly. And so when I have a question, I, I get the answer right away. Okay. And when my son asks me a question, like kids always are asking questions, you know, what is, how many meters are there in a mile? And if I don't know, I just ask Siri immediately. Hey, Siri, how many meters in a mile? And then we know. We don't say, oh, go look it up, go to the library, do you know, all the things we used to say. We don't have to do that. Good. They they gave us the translation. They think that uh, achievement could be éxito, éxito, oh, and uh, achievement is éxito and um, accomplishment logro. They yes. they suggest there those translations. Go. There you go. And there's a big difference, right? Yeah. So so that's that. It I think it really helps educators to make it that distinction, because what we what we typically measure is achievement. And we measure how, what grade you got, how high you did, how, what you did personally, you, 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 or me, 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 me. But what we're really after is what you do for other people. And, and what I would love for kids to say is, you see that last year, it was terrible. I don't care what it is, you know, it could be a place, it could be a book, it could be a something. Now it's great. And I did that with my team. We made that happen. That's what I call accomplishment. Oh, this is and fantastic. That, 
you know, you that, also mentioned empowerment in your presentations. Yeah. You, you use the word empowerment. I'm interested in that idea too. Well, that thank you for asking about that. That's really what I see as the biggest goal that I have now is empowering kids or helping them under, not so much empowering them as helping them understand how much they are now empowered by what's going on in their world. So when you uh, think of, think of, for example, a Greta Thunberg, right, in, in the, the environment girl uh, from Sweden, when she started, she didn't know she had any power. She just stood out there in the rain and protested. And then she tried to do, and those were things that we could do when I was in, you know, college 50 years ago. I mean, that was, but suddenly now she's realizing, oh, wait, I can organize kids all over the world to do this in their own places. I can organize a movement. She's got a Friday movement now. And, and so that's the power that young people have. And I, I mentioned at the beginning when, when we first talked, if you teach little kids and you want them to do something, to do a survey, in the past you could say, okay, there's two opinions on this, go survey your class or go survey your school and see how many people think each way. Today, you can say to the same kids, same age, go use SurveyMonkey and go survey a million people and the kids can do it. And so the level of power that kids have that hopefully they will use in positive ways is huge. And my goal with this 2 billion kid program and other things is to really help the kids understand that they're empowered. And while technology is very much a part of that power, it's not all of it. It's knowing that you're connected to people all over the world or that you can be. It's knowing that if I could only get my hands on a supercomputer, I could do this. If And soon that supercomputer will be in your pocket. And I like to think about, when I think about education, I don't say, what's it going to be like tomorrow? Because it's not going to be that different than today. I say, what's it going to be like in 20 years? What do we need to do to prepare kids for 20 years from now? And so that's particularly important, say, for language teachers, because you can easily say, well, now machines are not quite perfect and we have machine translation on our phones. And my kid loved it when he was studying in Spain. Um, he said, that's my best friend is my computer, my phone. But it's not perfect. We all know that, and it, uh, you know, so we continue to teach language the old way that we did it. But if you take the perspective of wait, every night it gets better. Every single day it gets better. Think about 20, 10 years from now even, five years, 10 years, 20 years when these kids are in the world. It will be so good that they will not learn, need to use the language. And the only people who will be bilingual are the people who are really bilingual. It won't pay to say just to know how to say, you know, how do I go to the bathroom? Because your machine can say that for you, right? But to be bilingual is a totally different experience. Unfortunately, relatively few get there unless you're lucky that you get it when you're very young. Uh, and so... We have to rethink, my sense is we just need to rethink what we're doing and why and what we give to kids. And, and it's, it's just in this particular context, I think it's a lot more beneficial to a kid to say, you know, in, in, in 10 years or in 20 years, by the time you're an adult, you will be using a machine to do this. Let's practice doing some of that. Let's figure out how to do it. It's even in the primitive state that we have. And let's not spend, you know, a million years drilling verbs into you because that's, you, that's not what you're going to do, right? So I'm, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, drilling is, is okay, but it's not enough. We need to understand. Well, I hope, that, I hope that matters to somebody. And what's interesting is that it's such a great opportunity for anybody who, who likes to think about this and who loves kids 
to help them go much further, much faster. Much further, much faster. Because think about how far a kid goes in their first year of language learning, or even in their second or third year. Not that far. I know. I've studied many languages. Um, and I'm stuck as an eternal intermediate in some of them. Um, but uh, I, got, I got good at one. But, but think of how much farther they could get. They could speak, say what they want to say. They could communicate with real people about real things uh, using because they are now empowered by this device that many of them have. And so think about that you can give them and help them have that power if you're their teacher. That's really, that's exactly what your role is as a teacher, is to give that power to your students. And now that power resides partially in their heads and partially in their machines. So I wish you good luck in inventing. Okay, a final question. Um, nowadays, most teachers have been forced to teach online because of the coronavirus thing. And some of them feel they didn't like using technology or couldn't before. And now they, they feel that they, are, they don't know what to do. So what advice can you give us or a word of hope or encouragement for this? Well, I, what I think, I think there is a lot of potential hope here, but the hope is not from doing the same things we used to do in an online way. That will probably be worse in many ways because we won't have any of the fun, no jokes, no, 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 any of the things that are, that may be good about being in person, we won't have. And all we'll have is, 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 is this, but if we say, we can now do so many new things. So we were talking about, we can now connect with, with kids in, in, in our time zone in the US or in Canada or somewhere else um, in real time. We can just do that. We can do it every day. And we can have the real, real conversations in real language. Or we can, uh, like we said, survey more people or do. There's so many things that we now can do that we didn't used to be able to do, the more we add those things, and I would add, the more we let each kid do whatever he or she wants and go in that direction. You know, we're all learning Spanish, but I want to learn it because I want to be a nurse, and I want to learn it because I want to be an astronaut, and I want to learn it because I want to play video games. That's very, those are all different Spanish or English, you know, things and words and vocabularies. So we can really now use this opportunity to be much, much more personalized than we ever were in the past. And yet we can figure out new ways to communicate. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I think we can stop streaming if that's okay with you. And uh, well, they've been translating a lot in the chat. If they need to ask anything, uh, this is the time. And I, you've been so generous with your time. I, this, be, be, before this live stream, there were lots of emails. Thank you for that. Lots of ch uh, chats, private chats. Thanks a lot for that. It means the world well, to thank me. Thank you. And let me just, let me just say, uh, muchísimas gracias a todos los argentinos y argentinas. However, you, is that how you say yes. people from Argentina? Yes. OK. Um, well, uh, muchas gracias. And I hope we get to do it again. And um, I hope my Spanish gets better. <laughs> okay. Yo trato a mejorar. Mejorarme. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll stop streaming. Okay. Okay. Stop live streaming.